Our scripture passage this morning is found in John chapter 1. We'll be reading verses 19 through 28. If you want to turn your Bibles along with me or follow along on the screens. I invite your attention to John chapter 1, beginning with verse 19. This is a testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah nor Elijah nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize you with water. But among you stands one whom you do not know, not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. Father, we come to you today, hearing your word. You have prepared our hearts to hear your word through powerful worship. You have drawn us in as we have sought you this morning, as we've gathered to commune with you and to with, with each other. So Father, I pray that you would speak to us through your word. I pray that you would reveal to us new truth and new light. Grow us in this time we have. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. I first want to thank Pastor Brandon Brown for filling in for me last week. I came down with bronchitis and a sinus infection late last week. And uh, I was uh, privileged to, to it, it's a privilege and a blessing to have such a capable staff that could just step in uh, at a moment's notice. And so I appreciate Brandon uh, for filling in for me. I, I've heard a lot of great reports about his message last week. And and so uh, uh, I appreciate him and thank him for that uh, service. And as we continue in our study, we're going to pick up where he left off. And we're going to pick right up here in John chapter 1, verses 19 to 28. Now, as we look at this section of Scripture, as we look at this particular passage, we actually turn a corner in thought. Up until this point, John has been building the case and, and basically establishing the theology of Jesus Christ. He's established the deity. He's, he's, he has, he has been, his train of thought has been to help us understand that God, it, it, the reality of God, the person of God, the presence of God, the mind of God, the expression of God is in full expression and in full presence in, in, in the person of Jesus Christ. And that's kind of been where he's at. He's kind of giving us the introduction, which is the central thought of the entire gospel. But now when we go into this passage that we just read, it actually begins the story of Jesus. We actually begin the narrative. As the narrative starts, we find it doesn't necessarily begin with Jesus before it begins with John the Baptist. And it begins with John the Baptist being asked this question. You may have noticed that I paused when I read it. This question John the Baptist was asked, who are you? Now, here John was, John the Baptist, drawing a crowd, sharing a message, but not for himself. He was pointing others to Jesus, right? He was gaining attention, gaining all of this notoriety, and even the attention of the Jewish leaders, and they come because, let's just be honest, a guy with the wearing weird clothes, eating locusts in the desert, 
giving this message that's different than any other message is going to draw some attention. But he draws his attention and they come to him and they asked him, who are you? Now, when he's asked that question, he, give, he gives a, a response we're going to talk about in a second. But I want to first ask you the question. If someone were to ask you that question, who are you? What would your answer be? Who are you? Would it be your name? Would it be your occupation, what you do for a living? Would it be your familial status? Would it be your political affiliation? Would it be your social status? Would it be what, what you're all about? What defines who you are? Who defines who you are? You see, John the Baptist in this moment, gaining all of this attention, had the opportunity to be the center focus of attention. In fact, he even had an opportunity to be worshipped. In fact, as late as, as 250 AD, we see writings from the, the Christian historic writer Clemente. And in that, those writings, it, he, he talks about how some of John the Baptist's disciples wrote of him as he was the Messiah. There were many who thought at this time that John the Baptist was the Messiah. But he didn't take that. He didn't absorb it. He didn't remain the center of attention. What did he do? He pointed to Jesus. And when he was asked, who are you? Who are you? He first begins by telling who he wasn't. He t they asked him if he was the Messiah. He said, no, I'm not the Messiah. He asked him if he was Elijah. Now, why would he ask him if he was Elijah? Have you ever wondered that? Why would they just bring Elijah out and, and ask him if he was Elijah? The reason that, the, that they asked him this was it was common in Jewish thought that Elijah would be the one to come back. You see, he, he went up to heaven. He didn't die like normal people died. He went up to heaven and the common Jewish traditional thought was that Elijah would come back and be the precursor to the Messiah and he would be the one proclaiming the Messiah's coming. And so they're asking him, are you Elijah? Are you the precursor for the Messiah? And he says, no, I'm not. And there's a mystery in that, which we won't unravel for time's sake. But you see that he's, he's telling them who he's not. And he said, they ask him, are you a prophet? Nope. Then who are you? And this is what he says. I am the voice. That's it. I am the voice. Think about that. He could have shared all of his resume. He could have shared all of his accolades. He could have shared all of his connections, right? He was a cousin of Jesus. He could have shared all of these things about him. But what's he said, when he was asked who he was, his answer was, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. And he uses the prophecy now, I, of Isaiah. Now, what I, what I love about what John does here, what John the Baptist does here, is he, he first has a good understanding of who he isn't before he has a good understanding of who he is, right? You see, had, had John not possessed the, the clarity to know who he was not, he would never have been able to understand who he was. And I think that's a good lesson for all of us, isn't it? For us to know who we are, we first must know who we are not. And John the Baptist had a proper perspective of who he was in light of Jesus Christ. And he says, I'm not this, I'm not that, I'm not them, I'm just a voice. Pointing people to the real Messiah. For John, he was a voice calling from outside of the established religious society and order and introducing a new way, a new life, a new way that is found in Jesus Christ. Now this was perfect timing because the people were hungry for hope. The people of Israel were starving for something new, something 
uh, that, that brought them hope and salvation. The, the, the culture was oppressed. At this time in history, they first were, not only were they dealing with the oppression of the Roman government, but they were also dealing with the burden of the, the Pharisees and the religious leaders who, who, who cast heavy burdens of, of, of the Mosaic law you know, holding them to follow it to a T. And so, so they, were, they were looking for some way to find hope, to find redemption, to find salvation, to find joy that they were not finding in religion of the time. And so it, God knows exactly what he's doing, does he not? He knows exactly when to come and how to come. And so we see here the perfect timing. So John, John uses this moment with the captive audience. And they were searching for hope. And knowing that people were searching for hope, John, the center of attention in this moment, still made sure that he immediately shifts the attention away from himself and onto Jesus. And I don't want us to miss this. People today, you know, I know, people here, are looking for hope. Amen? It, all you got to do is turn on the TV for five minutes and watch the news. Or read the newspaper, if anybody does that anymore. Or go online. Just People today are looking for hope. Especially in this nation. Because they're not finding it in the world. And so when people are looking, people all around us, and times when we are given the opportunity to help, when we are given the opportunity to make a difference in their lives, we need to remember who we are not so that we can remember who we are. We need to not draw attention to ourselves and act like we have the answers and that we can provide hope we need to remember who we aren't so that we can remember who he is. Only Jesus can give hope. Only Jesus Christ can save. Only Jesus Christ can heal. Only Jesus Christ can forgive. Only Jesus Christ can redeem. We can provide what we can provide as the church, as followers of Jesus Christ, what we can provide, what we can offer that truly transforms, that truly changes lives, that does give hope from Christ, is all from Christ. It's not from us. It's not from our goodness. It's not from our charisma. It's not from our, our talent. It's from Jesus Christ by the power of none other than the Holy Spirit. We are not light ourselves. We are only a reflection of the light. Jesus is like the sun, and we are like the moon shining in the darkness. And John the Baptist knew this. We cannot fix or save people. I got, I, I'm sorry to, if you did not know that by now. I, Pastor Dwayne, cannot save you. It's not within my power. And there's a lot that I can't fix. But I know who can. And it's my job to point you to him. It's my job to be a voice. Merely a voice. Now in John the Baptist's case, there were some who mistakenly believed that he was the Messiah. And John the Baptist did have a following. But it was not because he wanted it himself. And we see this story unfold and it, it's just so evident how easy it is for people, for humanity to follow other people, right? Ever since the beginning of civilization after the fall, mankind has found many countless ways to create gods. Some of them are human, other human beings, but they would elevate them to emperor status or, or godlike status. Sometimes they would create idols or create gods. In, in, in any case, throughout history, we, we know throughout all civilization that humanity has a longing to worship something. There's, there's something that God created in us 
for, for us to worship and follow something or someone, a higher being. That's just, that's an eight in all of our, our DNA. It's hardwired in our creation. But since the fall, that was deformed. And so we, we find this manifested in so many different ways, right? Now, at the time of Jesus, the Roman emperor was seen as a god. He was worshipped like a god. And so, so many in the Roman Empire devoted themselves to the Roman emperor as they would to God. The Jews being the exception. But here, even in this situation, we find... We find people following a person, people fo following John the Baptist. We find people following the Pharisees. There's a temptation to worship the creature rather than the creator. And if we do not know who God is, if we do not know who Jesus Christ is, we will find ourselves worshiping creatures rather than the creator. The, the, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1 verse 25 says this so well. It, 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 and I won't read the whole passage, but it talks about how the, 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 the minds are darkened and, and they've gone astray. And in verse 25 it says, Because they have exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. That's the Apostle Paul talking about this. It happened then. But it also happens now, right? We worship celebrities. We worship athletes. We worship political leaders. We worship religious leaders. Unfortunately, I've heard so many times Christians through the years who have attached themselves to a Christian author or a Christian teacher and almost become a disciple of them rather than a disciple of Jesus. And if we're, if we're not careful, it's easy to do. John the Baptist could have capitalized on this moment, but he didn't. He did not absorb the attention, but rather deflected it and turned it to Jesus. Now, if you have a captive audience like John does or did, how would you respond? Whether it's 2,000 people, 200 people, or 20 people, or just two people in your own life, who are we drawing their attention to? This is a real good question for us to ask. When you have a captive audience, when people are listening to you, when you have an opportunity to influence someone, who are you drawing your attention to? Is it yourself or is it Jesus? That's a really important question we need to ask ourselves honestly. How are our conversations flavored and seasoned? Are we building up ourselves? Are we absorbing adoration? Are we seeking the applause and the approval of men? Or are we giving God the glory through our attitudes, our words, and our actions? Those are really important questions, are they not? John is pointing others to Jesus. And as he pointed them to Jesus, he opened the door for them to see him and know him. See, that's what happens. When we direct attention away from ourselves and we point our, their attention to Jesus, all of a sudden, their hearts are prepared to see and know him. But we can get in the way sometimes, can't we? Has any of us ever gotten in the way of Jesus? Jesus. We need to always remember it is never about us and it's always about him. As we point people to Jesus, we prepare them for his arrival in their lives. John the Baptist used Isaiah and he, he used this, this uh, prophecy in Isaiah and I'll read it to you. It says, A voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the, the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places plain. Now, John uses this, and when he uses this, this prophecy, automatically they say, oh, they, 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 they get a mental picture in their minds. They get it. Because what, what happened here in the ancient 
days, you would have a king, when he would enter into a province, they, they would uh, have to clear a path because ancient roads were not paved or graveled or straight like ours. Many of the ancient roads were like trails, maybe dirt. And they would wind around the landscape. They would have ditches and potholes and boulders and branches in the way. And so a party would have to go out there and literally prepare the pathway, clear the way, make room for the king. They would fill the potholes. They would remove the boulders. They, in other words, they would bring the high places down and the low places up to make level. So when he was talking about this, uh, the, it, it registers but John's not talking about a physical road. He's talking about a spiritual road, more namely our hearts. And he's saying, I'm pointing you now to Jesus, so now make room for God. Make room for Christ. Make a way. The high places in your life and the low places, bring them up and bring them down. The way made level. In that, in that making room for God, it is, it is being pointed to Christ by someone else and then when that happens, this thing happens where we, we are then preparing for his arrival. We're preparing for him to move and work and walk and live in our lives. But he's saying we've got to make room. We've got, we got, we got to make the pathway straight. We've got to get rid of the debris. We've got to get rid of the clutter. We've got to get rid of what's in the way. What John the Baptist is saying here is make way in your hearts. Make way, make room. Whether it's making room for God by removing all forms of unhealthy debris, unhealthy habits, unhealthy self-esteem, whether it's too high or too low, whether it's expectations or prejudices or sin or idolatry, both on the individual and the community level, he's saying make way, make room so that I can come. We want more of God's presence, do we not? I do. I believe you do. So are we making a way? Today, as we hear, read this story, I want to close with a question that I started with. Because as we read this story and we see the Pharisees ask John the Baptist, who are you? So he's a pointer to Jesus. You and I are pointers to Jesus. That's what we are. We've already covered that. We don't have light in ourselves other than the light of Christ. We are reflections of Jesus' light. So we're pointers to Jesus. And John the Baptist has asked this question, who are you? So I want to ask you, who are you? As citizens of the kingdom of heaven... Every leader, every preacher, every teacher, every single disciple of Jesus needs to merely be a voice. And not just a verbal voice, but a voice. Your life is a voice. Your actions, your attitudes, the way you spend yourself, that's your voice. Are you a voice that points others to Jesus? Are you helping others prepare the way have you prepared the way? Each and every circumstance, as our worship team comes to close our service this morning, I want to close with this thought. Each and every circumstance of life confronts us with the decision to define who we are and who we are not. How we relate to each other, how we relate to God, how we spend our time, how we spend our energy, how we spend our money, our very lives, how we spend our very lives defines who we are and who we are not. So who am I? Who are you? My prayer today for us is as we have been introduced 
to the story of Jesus and we're just breaking in. That we would be faithful voices. That we would get over ourselves, that we would shed ourselves of ourselves, that we would get out of the way and allow Christ to fill us and to live through us. Amen? Don't you want that? That we would constantly be redirecting adoration, redirecting attention to Christ and Christ alone. For He is our only hope. And in that, that we are preparing the way for the Lord in our hearts and that we're helping each other and others prepare the way for the Lord in our hearts. That we would help each other break down the walls of pride and selfishness and greed. That we would help each other fill in the holes that depression and discouragement and sin and abuse have created. That we fill places and, and bring places down though it's less of its level. And that all of us are level at the foot of the cross. That's my prayer today. And as we do, I pray that we too will be a faithful voice. I invite those who have asked to come and help serve communion this morning, if they come at this time.